Hello, everyone. Thank you so much again for joining us for another great edition of Moving Beyond the Coronavirus Economy Series. My name is Tom Dufour, and I'm the founder and CEO of Big Sky Franchise Team. And this webinar session that we're going to be covering is focused specifically on current macro and economic events that are going on uh, at large around the United States. We'll take a look at some global issues that are going on, and we'll talk about some very micro niche events that are going on in the small business community, as well as in the franchise community, and be talking about how this is going to impact your franchise marketing and your franchise sales efforts, and maybe some suggestions about how you can change some of your phrasing to take these ideas and thoughts into consideration. So uh, with that being said, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it here today. If you do have questions, if you do have comments, if you have something you'd like to um, uh, uh, ask about, please just type it into the chat box. This is a live session. So um, please go ahead, type it into chat, Q&A, uh, use the little hand raise feature. Um, uh, the live audience on these are generally small enough that we can accommodate any questions or um, comments or thoughts that you might have as we get going on this. So with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and start off um, with some of the first charts that I, I start off with most of the time when we start going into these. So the first chart here is really in reference to this from the Institute for Supply Management, um, and they have a Purchasing Managers Index report. And I always like to showcase and talk about this one specifically because uh, manufacturing is a leading indicator. Uh, and so when we take a look at manufacturing, these are what the purchasing managers, uh, what when they get surveyed, they're saying we're buying, what uh, are we increasing orders, decreasing orders, what, what are we doing here? So in the month of May, and this report comes out once a month, so it shows you for the month of May here, um, it, it said that uh, manufacturing grew in May as the manufacturing PMI registered 56.1%, 0.7 percentage point higher than the April reading of 55.4%. The manufacturing PMI continued to indicate solid sector expansion and U.S. economic growth in May. Four of the five sub-indexes that directly factor into the manufacturing PMI were in growth territory. All of the six biggest manufacturing industries, which include machinery, computer and electronic products, food, beverage, and tobacco products, transportation equipment, petroleum and coal products, and chemical products, registered moderate to strong growth in May. So how do you digest this and take in, in from this? Well, in my opinion, at least, uh, when I look at this, this means to me that all things uh, considered the state of what it is, the signs are pointing forward that, that things are going to continue to, to grow, that the, the economy, albeit with, and we'll be talking about inflation and interest rates and such here in a little bit, um, but all things considered, the economy is, the manufacturing is uh, seeing things, seeing purchases, which means consumers are buying things. And we are a consumer driven economy. So when the consumer's buying things, um, that's, that's uh, generally a good sign uh, for, for the economic health. Uh, we'll go and talk about now the second report that the purchase that in, the Institute for Supply Management produces. This is the Purchasing Managers Index on the services industry. And it shows that PMI was at 55.9%. I might add, by the way, that at 50%, I'm, I'm jumping back to the manufacturing section here, uh, at 50% is the manufacturing economy breakeven line. And then 48.7% is the overall economy breakeven line. So when we dip below that, really that 50th percentile, or, or start getting very close to it, you know, we, we want to start paying attention to that. Um, and then the same here for the services, as we look at the services here, and it says in May, the services PMI registered 55.9%, a 1.2 percentage point decrease compared to the April reading of 57.7%. The 12 month average is 61.2%, is which reflects consistently strong growth in the services sector. This month's reading, however, is the lowest figure since February of 2021, when the index also registered 55.9. The May reading indicates the services sector grew for the 24th consecutive month. Uh, reading above 50 
50% indicates the services sector economy is generally expanding. Below 50% indicates the services sector is generally contracting. And you can kind of see this trend line, um, you know, without even plotting it back in 2020, you kind of see this going up into the right. And now here in 2022, it looks like it's starting to go down into the right a little bit, kind of leveling out. So, you know, you, you still see that it's growing overall, though. Um, so just just uh, something for the broad economy to see. And then this is the, the Institute for Supply Management, uh, their newest report, and this is on hospitals and the hospital PMI. Purchasing Managers Index report registered 56.9% in May, a 0.6% point increase from April reading of 56.3, indicating a 24th consecutive month of growth. And one thing to make, uh, it says the business activity and new orders index in indexes decreased in May compared to April. The employment index moved back into growth territory after contracting in April. The case mix index registered 53%, an increase of six percentage points compared to the April figure of 47%. The day's uh, payable outstanding index reading of 55% is up four and a half percentage points from the 50.5% report in April. So the, the point to take a look at this here, we really saw in 2020, it looked like here really in March, a huge drop in March, dropped down to about right around 50%. Um, and as we saw what looked like orders at hospitals uh, declining, what, what largely seemed to be driven from just the uh, hold on uh, advanced order purchasing for COVID related areas. And now it's, it's looks like it's popping back up and maybe uh, going to hold steady there. We'll, we'll see. Uh, the point for these three reports is that these are things that if your uh, franchise candidates are worried about these or nervous about these topics, you can be talking about them. And while we're not going to predict the future, when we're looking at this, it does give us a few alternative economic indicators than sometimes the just one shot, uh, uh, for example, inflationary number that it's going to show us. So uh, by way of example, let's take a look at inflation. And this is from the Pew Research Center that was published uh, June 14th. So that was just three days ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the U.S. inflation rate, it says, the heading says, the U.S. inflation rate has almost quadrupled over the past two years, but in many other countries, it's risen even faster. And I'll zoom in here uh, just so that we can take a quick look at this uh, chart. And you can see that at the top of the chart, Israel's inflation rate is 25 times the inflation rate it was in the first quarter of 2020. Greece's is just over 20 percent. Italy's is looks to be around 19%. Spain's looks to be around 14%. Portugal, around 11%, and so on down the line. And then you have uh, the United States, which is down here, showing it at just under uh, about five times the inflation rate. So just from a global perspective, um, you know, we hear a lot about our own country's inflation rate going on here in the U.S. Um, <clears throat> there's not as much discussion about what's going on globally. And again, you know, global inflation is an issue that we all need to be aware about in, in the global economic climate we all uh, live and work within. But these are things for us just to at least take notice of that uh, it, it, this is this is happening elsewhere, and it's it, the uh, percentage is not as severe as what appears to be in a lot of Europe um, and, and, and other parts of the world here. So that's one. And now we're going to take a look at the U.S. inflation rate. And this is tr from tradingeconomics.com. They've got the inflation uh, for the cons uh, CPI, uh, Consumer Price Index, and this is trading economics. And this is their all time. So this dates back all the way to the 1930s on the far left. It shows the consumer price index inflation rate um, each over over time during that that time period. So you can see from 19, well, it looks like almost 1920, it goes back to here. So about 100, just over 100 years of inflation rates for us to take a look at. And the reason I'm showing this is because we can, it, it just to help give us some perspective about what's going on, uh, some historical perspective, I should say. So we can see that in the 1980s was the la early 80s is the last time inflation was as high as it is now, which we're showing around that eight to 9%, seven, eight, 9% here that we're going through 
right now, this very moment in time. <clears throat> and, uh, and so you can see after about 1985 or so, uh, and really into the mid 90s, inflation has stayed relatively stable somewhere between, you know, uh, zero to 5% inflation rate. Um, for uh, what 25 years so something we we kind of became very accustomed to for having this uh and reduced very little volatility and so you see this uh economic shock we're experiencing right now and so uh these are real things this inflation is real we see it happening uh, we can just see it and <laughs> gas prices food prices are the the fastest way that we see this as a general consumer uh, but these are things for you to think about as you're talking with prospective buyers that, yes, inflation is happening. Historically, when we look at it, it, it is there. There are other periods in history where it's been far worse. Um, certainly, this is not good. <laughs> this is not a positive thing. But as I've mentioned on previous episodes of this, when we think about the inflation rate, it's one more reason why we want to encourage our franchise candidates to be making a decision to move now because literally their dollar is worth much less in a month from now, 30 days from now, when it's going up 7%, 8%, 8.5%, 8.5% a month. When we're com by comparison, that, that, that's a big change in the value of their dollar. So uh, it, it, this is, again, not to um, strong arm anyone into wanting to buy a franchise. It's just letting them know if they are very serious about it and they're planning to do it anyway, every month, every week that they do this a, a week sooner, it, it, it's maximizing that dollar they have uh, for to help uh, mitigate some of the inflationary costs that are occurring. So let's take a look at, speaking of franchise sales uh, and, and uh, franchisee loans in particular. So one thing I wanted to make a note of, uh, this was from, this is a chart from the Growth Corp. It's a, uh, an SBA lender, and they have the average, um, it's the 20-year effective rate for an SBA loan over the last uh, 20, or, I'm sorry, I think it's 15 years. They did this over the last 15 years. So this was from uh, June of 2007 to June of 2022. And so I just want to point out, and I attended a great session that the International Franchise Association led a, a couple weeks ago, talking about business loans and franchising. And <clears throat> what you can see here is that really over the course of the last 15 years, our, the current SBA lend, lo, loan rate for a small business loan is at 5.13% for that 20-year effective rate, okay? If we look just across line, well, back in 2018, uh, 2014, 2015, that, that was a pretty normal rate just going back five years ago, seven years ago, uh, 10 years ago. These rates uh, back in 07, it was up at 7%. Um, so we're still like when you think of it from a, a big picture, we've all got we've all become used to and accustomed to cheap uh, <laughs> rates, inexpensive rates to borrow money. So call it, quote, cheap money. Um, and uh, so now rates are bouncing back up to where they have been for some time. So I just want you to think about that. And if that's something that might be helpful for you to explain to a candidate, you may have a candidate that says, well, I was going to do this, but you know, the, the rates are going up or, you know, this is a way to help explain to them that, well, actually rates are just kind of going back to where they were. We actually were at a really discounted time period for a few years. And now we're kind of back to where it's been for the 10 years prior to that, or almost 15 years before that. Uh, I wanted to show also quickly the 30 year fixed mortgage rate in the US. Um, this is a time period. This is from the St. Louis Federal Reserve, uh, this chart. And you can see here, starting back in 1971, uh, the 30-year uh, fixed mortgage was 7.33%. And you can just almost run across here. You go into the 80s. Um, it wasn't until right around uh, 2000 that we actually dipped below 7% consistently for mortgage rates. And then you look for 2000 to 2010, mortgage rates kind of hovered in that six, five and a half to maybe looks like six and a half percent uh, 
um, rate. And then it was a 2010s to 2020s where we really had these sub five, uh, below 5% interest rates. So, you know, on a historical standpoint, this is extremely uh, rare. And you can kind of see this trend line of a 30 year fix just kind of progressively declining over many, many decades, over 40 years of just consistent declining in, um, in 30 year fixed mortgage rates. And here now we're back up as of June of 16th, as of yesterday, it was at 5.78%. So uh, just to put help put things in perspective, so uh, whether it's for home buying, you know, people that, that may be buying a franchise, they're thinking about this. So I, I think it helps sometimes to help put things in a historical standpoint just to help review it when you're talking to prospects. Maybe you even write a blog article or a comment about this on, on your own website or produce some literature just to talk about this and how this may impact your franchise system and how you're addressing it or looking to uh, make accommodations to address it. So uh, as the old saying goes, knowledge is power. And so we're, if we can educate and showcase it, wow, from a, from a broad historical standpoint, now, interest rates are still actually pretty low. I mean, anything really prior to 2010, you can see that the, mor the <laughs> mortgage rate today is better than we were getting back in 2006, 2005, back in 2000, back in 1995, back in the, the 90s when people were buying things. So just help keep, keep that perspective. Okay, um, let's jump gears a little bit here and... Uh, we're going to talk a little bit, and, and by the way, are there any questions on that? I'll just open that up while while we're we're at this point here for a kind of a midway transition. Uh, if there are, just go ahead and feel free to to uh, type in the chat box there for me. Um, then uh, the the next uh, conversation here is about the small business startup sentiment index. Okay, and this really gives us a great pulse of what the budding entrepreneurs are thinking, what are these small future small business owners, current small business owners, what are they thinking? What's going on in their mind? What's their sentiment on business? So we've got all of these macro things happening from a big picture, but what about the small business community? These are the people that these, these startups, these are the people that are thinking about buying your franchise. So the first question is, survey respondents agree that now is a good time for a startup. So this was from May of 2022. This report was released June 1st, by the way. So this comes out once a month. And it shows that 39% of the people strongly agree that now is a good time for a startup. And 28.4% say they agree. So 67.4%, so essentially two-thirds, just over two-thirds of people that are thinking about starting a business they agree or strongly agree that now is a good time to start a business. So as you, as we went through a lot of those macroeconomic figures and some, you know, is kind of a mixed bag. We had some showing positive signs, some showing not so great signs. And so we, we see a balance here. And the overall sentiment is that now is still a good time. Two out of three people are still thinking that. Uh, the outlook on business conditions is split. So um, when, when asked, do you think that business is getting going to be better or much better, worse or much worse? Um, it, we see that 76.6% see conditions staying the same or getting better. So it looks like it's kind of about neutral. <clears throat> We've got about, it said here, 29 20, uh, roughly 29% of respondents believe that in the next three months, conditions will be better or much better. And about 23.4% see conditions as worse or much worse. And then the balance, 76.6%, so th roughly three out of four people, um, think that things are going to stay the same or get better. So we're kind of in this middle, you know, most, if you were to average this out, most people are thinking it's going to be about the same uh, in terms of broad economic conditions. So that's in the sentiment, the psyche of the people that are, are thinking of starting up a business. Um, timing, 78% of people that responded said that they expect to start up their business within the next six months. So that's be before the end of this year. So know that almost 
eight out of 10 people or prospective franchisees you're talking to are thinking about getting started this year. And so I think it's important to remind them as we're coming into the tail end of quarter two, that quarter three and four are going to move real fast. And so as they always do, they always go faster than we think. And so it's important to remind them, especially if you're in a fixed location kind of a business, even a service-based business, some of your businesses may have some seasonality. Spring may be a great time to start or winter may be a great time to start or just getting a lease signed. If you're in a fixed location, you may just need a lease. And the sooner you can start searching for that property and getting that lease negotiation process started, the better. So uh, be talking about these things with your candidates as they're coming through. Um, so I, I thought that this was interesting that 78% uh, of respondents said they, they plan to start within the next six months. Um, let's take a look here. Um, so concerns over funding still are, is the number one issue. Here, I'll scroll down here. Almost 69% of respondents say that funding or access to credit is their biggest single factor into uh, buying or starting their business. I'm going to zoom in on this a little bit. So we've been talking about this a lot since uh, it, 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 early on when uh, COVID had started. And even during the COVID time period, the number one concern was access to or getting funding. Uh, it still remains the same. And you can see that the trend, it's kind of gone down a little, up a little, down a little, up a little. It's kind of trending down right now, actually, which is interesting to see that the concerns of funding is just, it seems to be on a trend lying down. It was at 75% back in, what was that? This was June, May, or I'm sorry, May. <clears throat> this was back in uh, March or April. It was 75% of respondents were concerned. And now it's dropped down to 66.7%. So we kind of see this decline happening. Uh, number two concern is economic climate. And we kind of see this economic climate starting to go up um, the last few months. Uh, and that, that seems to kind of co have coincided with the, uh, the, the, um, uh, it, it, the, the global climate with uh, the Russia and Ukraine and the, the, those global concerns uh, going on. Um, uh, we see the stock market, despite kind of what's happening, that's on a decline of interest. So all of these other stock market is under 10%. Political changes, you know, that has spiked a little bit here. It's increased. Uh, that bumped up to 17%. Regulatory changes have increased to 17%. Um, but overall, we see these others are relatively low compared to funding. And I know we talked a lot about it each week, or excuse me, each month, but if it, having some funding sources, there are some great franchise lender lending organizations and fran uh, uh, broker lenders available that specialize in franchise funding that you can reach out to. Uh, they're uh, finding a great SBA bank. Uh, great uh, tip is if you've received an SBA loan to start your business, or you have franchisees that have received a loan from a specific bank, find out what bank they use and call that bank. They might be able to work an arrangement. If they felt confident in your business model, there's a good chance they'll like your franchise. They'll be able to help get lending for other franchisees as, as, you, through, as you think about that. Um, so let's go ahead. I'm just taking a look here. All right, I'm going to jump over here. A new report that came out this week, June 15th, two days ago. Um, and I love that Franchise Insights, um, franchiseinsights.com, by the way, is where the Small Business Sentiment Index comes up, uh, comes from. And uh, they've been running a, a pretty regular report for what do prospects, franchise prospects, how do they like to be contacted? And it seems they run this report every, I don't know, six, nine 12 months or so, um, and they update it. And this is the most current one. It says, best practices update. Franchise prospects reveal their order preferences for initial contact. In June 15, 2022, it says the most, most franchise perspective, prospects, 45.8%, prefer to be emailed for the initial contact with a franchise they have chosen, according to the monthly mystery shopping survey by FranchiseInsights.com in June of 2022. Further, in all but two of the 29 monthly surveys by FranchiseInsights.com over the last three years, email was the clear preference 
for initial contact. In the remaining two instances, email and texts tied for first preference. Um, so what does that mean? Well, it means that candidates prefer email, period. Like that's how they want to be contacted. They submit a contact form. They want you to send a response back, an email. So the nice thing is most CRMs and programs and campaigns can have an automatic email response go back. Um, and then the second is going to be a text message here. So you can see this in this case, about half the respondents prefer, um, prefer an email. Uh, what's interesting for first choice, uh, 30 uh, uh, phone call is over text message. So I wonder, that makes me wonder, are people maybe getting inundated a little bit with text messaging and it's kind of falling down? They don't want to be bugged via text. Um, and then second choice is clear favorite, uh, clearly preferred is uh, text messaging. And then third choice is phone call. So if you were to do anything, you should send an email. Second step would be a text message and third would be a voicemail. Just some uh, thoughts and suggestions and ideas there for you to be thinking about how you're maybe adjusting your franchise sales practice. Um, we talked about this one already. Ah, okay. So now Franchise Insights is owned by Franchise Ventures, which owns a bunch of franchise lead generating franchise portals. So this is a little self-serving, but nonetheless, I think it's still a very important point to make, especially for emerging brands that are new and don't have a large brand recognition or brand awareness. And so the, the subject is the role, it says the, the role of franchise lead generation portals in awareness and consideration. So what it's showing here is that it says June 8th, 2022, a minority 6.4% of aspiring franchise owners are already very familiar with the franchises they inquire about. Another 23% are somewhat familiar to them according to surveys of interested franchise seekers to portal sites collected January through May of 2022. They likely come for the convenience of comparisons in one place. But the same survey shows that 40% are only vaguely familiar and 30.6% are completely unfamiliar with their ultimate selections. So the primary functions of portal sites is to make an introduction to generate awareness and consideration of options at a one-stop shop. And that tends to be true because consistently we tend to see that franchise portals um, have a closing rate or a conversion rate ranging between 200 to 400 leads it takes to generate that one franchise sale um, out of just specifically franchise portal sales. So we're think of this as creating awareness. If, if that means that what it's saying here is that 70.6% uh, if we add up completely unfamiliar and vaguely familiar, 70.6% of the people that end up inquiring about brands in, in, uh, on these franchise portals really don't know anything about that brand. And for most of the brands that I've worked with and our company works with, most are emerging brands. So just food for thought uh, about staying active with a franchise portal or two to keep a steady lead flow in and to continue to build that awareness. So just uh, you know, a, a, a little thought on that. Um, two quick things before we go. Uh, two, uh, this is the most active franchise categories. So these are over the vast, it says the following franchise ca category showed the greatest inquiries on the franchise ventures platform of the websites and mobile apps over the last 90 days. So over the last 90 days, here are the most active. So home services still reigns supreme at 18.5%. However, I will note, this is the first time home services has been under 20% of the inquiries in probably almost two years it's been coming up on that. So it's been a long time as the, the very clear cut leader and look at food and restaurant. Okay, people can say what they want, have a hunch about what they want, but here's what people are actually requesting. Food and restaurant is back to number two on the list. 17.8%, and it looks to be rising quick. So I wouldn't be surprised over the next 90 days if we see food and restaurant maybe surpass home services here as the number one category for interest. I, th I find that very interesting. Business services edged up again at 13.2%, senior and healthcare at 12.1%, cleaning and maintenance at 10%. 
financial services, 4.8%, child-related, 4.5%, health and fitness, 3.4%, education, 3.1%, and retail at 27 Fast risers, I would make note of, computer and internet saw almost a 500% growth rate of interest, and automotive is surging at 329.5%. So just some uh, key factors for you to be thinking about. Um, and, uh, and let me stop my share. And that's the quick highlight here. I know we move fast on a lot of this. I hope this was helpful to give you a snapshot in a short window of what's happening in the macro world of uh, economic data, coupled with some uh, franchise and small business data for you to be thinking about as you're growing your business. Are there any questions before we break here from folks? Um, uh, oh, thank you for attending. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, great. You grew up in uh, Montana. Well, uh, we are not in Montana. I can't say that we are. We're actually in the Atlanta area, but we love the great state of Montana, uh, where our, uh, our name certainly is uh, with Big Sky Country out there. So thank you. That's great. Um, well, Jeff, Nicole, thank you for your comments. Thank you to the rest of you for tuning in. Um, remember, if you have not subscribed to our podcast, check that out. It's Multiply Your Success on any of your favorite podcast subscriptions, Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Um, and then we will be back here, I believe, next week with a great webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great weekend.